You are listening to the podcast When Life Gives You Lemons, presented by me, Emma Levy. Having worked with elite athletes for most of my career, it's always intrigued me that a significant number of high-performing individuals have encountered some form of adversity earlier in their lifetime. My fascination into this grew when I had my own brush with adversity when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in May 2020, in the midst of the global pandemic at the age of just 36. During this period, I questioned, was it my positive mindset, or maybe something deeper, which enabled me to bounce back and to train and compete for a triathlon just one month following completion of all active cancer treatment? The goal of this podcast is to explore this concept further by meeting a variety of high-performing individuals who have experienced adversity, but who have come back stronger. So today, I'm welcoming Louisa Klein to the podcast. Hi. Louisa is an actress who has made who made her television debut in 2001 in the popular program Judge John Deed. Over the subsequent years, she has graced our television screens in a number of well-known shows, including Casualty, Holby City, Doctors and Midsummer Murders. In 2018, she accepted the role of the controversial character of Maya Stepney in Emmerdale, which won her much acclaim and even an award for Best Bad Girl at the Inside <laughs> Soap Awards. Louisa is also a very well-respected theatre actor, having starred in a number of critically acclaimed plays, including The Railway Children, which I remember thoroughly enjoying. And she has just finished a run of Jews in Their Own Words at the Royal Court Theatre, a play which used verbatim interviews to portray anti-Semitism in the UK, which, as we will explore in this podcast, was particularly relevant to her as the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. <laughs> Louisa. Hi Emma. Thank you so much for joining us today. Firstly, um, you've just finished using their own words at the Royal Court. I saw it. I thought Mm -hmm. the play was truly fantastic. And I love what you wrote in your in your Twitter feed on the opening night. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to read that. Tonight I get to open a play I couldn't be prouder to be part of. At a theatre that is a dream to work at, with a company of actors I'm keeping hold tight to. Sometimes my choice of career has caused me enormous heartache and sometimes it just all aligns. So I can imagine this play was particularly pertinent to you as a daughter of a Holocaust survivor. And today I really want to discuss the impact that your mum's story has had on you, in particular, maybe around the concept of inherited trauma. So to start with, could you briefly tell us a bit about your mum's experience during the Second World War? Sure. So my mum was born in 1939 in Amsterdam. She was born into a culturally Jewish family, but most certainly not a religiously Jewish family. Um, My grandparents, Tusi and Haines Salomonson, um, Tusi was an actress (laughs) and my grandfather, Haine, was an architect. He'd studied at the Bauhaus with Le Corbusier. (laughs) And so they were both creatives. They um, were living before the war. And when my mum was born, they were living in this incredible apartment block that was um, almost like a a commune in the most beautiful sense of the word Mm -hmm. of of artists, creatives, um, photographers, actors, dancers, singers, musicians and not all Jewish, they were very assimilated Dutch people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when um, the war began, I know that there was, there's a story of my, gr- my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mum. Yeah. She went to America and she said, come with me, I'll take you. And mm-hmm. they were like, no, we're fine, we're, we're, we're Dutch. Yeah. They really didn't feel like they were first and foremost Jewish. Yeah. Um, but obviously that didn't help them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... In, I think it was, so So Holland was invaded, I think, in 1941. Right. And um, my mum was given away. Mm-hmm. My grandparents separated. Um, my grandfather went into extreme hiding. Right. And my grandmother initially went into also similar hiding. They separated. I think they felt that they would, they would have more chance of survival, wow. or at least one of them might mm-hmm. survive. Um, hiding so, in Holland? Hiding or? in Amsterdam. Okay, yeah. in Amsterdam. Right. Yeah. Um, and they gave my mum away. Mm-hmm. Now, there's there's different accounts of the story. Okay. My mum, I think it's always really interesting, the story that my mum tells mm-hmm. is that she was given away to a children's home for a bit, and she right. was so deeply unhappy. She stopped eating. She was just absolutely destroyed. Mm-hmm. She was only, what, three? Wow. Um, so she... They then 
they then went through again this is this is un, not exactly ex, uh, sort of the fact i'm not entirely sure of but they um it was organized that a family would take her in right um and the first extraordinary part of this story is that after she left the children's home the children's home was bombed wow. very very soon after so wow. she survived that wow. <laughs> um was she with her siblings no her she had a little baby sister who mm. was a newborn baby was given away to a different family right um so she was totally on her own mm. um and her take of the story is that she was in a room and a man came in and she said i want to go with you and the man took her now, she remembers that. She remembers that. Now, whether that's entirely true, mm. I love the idea that she's taking control of that narrative yeah. and she's taking control yes. of of her future. Yes. Um, so she went to live with this man mm -hmm. who had, I think, at that point, two children of his own okay. in a, um, a part of Holland called Campen, right. which was um, which my sister and I actually visited mm. a couple of years ago. Um and that was on the BBC program. On the BBC documentary, yeah. my, my Family, The Holocaust and Me, yeah. exactly. And we, we watched that. That was, that was brilliant. Yeah, so it was Very an extraordinary experience, that, mm. that program. Um, and we went to Campen and we visited the house that she lived in. Yeah. Um, and actually, her memories of that time were very, very happy. Okay. They are... She loved going to church. Yeah. She loved all the music. <laughs> my mum is a musician. And right. um, she said that she remembers he played the violin. Mm -hmm. And so she would listen to him playing the violin. Wow. And it, it was. she's always been, even to this day, she's a country person. She loves mm -hmm. the countryside, even though she's a city person as well. Yeah. Like she, she needs the countryside. And, yeah. and, and Campen was very much country. Wow. So she has, she has these vague memories of that she's talked about of sort of once being hidden in an attic with a motorbike. Right. And when sort of a bit of research was done about that, they it was discovered that the motorbikes from the Germans were stolen a lot. Right. So it's it, it, it is probably just a glimpse of a memory that, yeah. that is correct. Yeah. It's quite extraordinary yeah. sort of little things. This is a three-year-old to right. a six-year-old. So she was there for three years until, three the four, until the end of the Until the end of the war. Again, she has memories of of a woman coming to visit her mm -hmm. with lipstick on. Was that her mum? It was her mum. Wow. Yeah, but she has no real memories of her mother before the war. I and wonder if she was told it was her mum at the time. Probably not, because mm. I would imagine that the less that she knew, the better. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was a point she also remembers where she had to go away for a little bit because it got a bit dangerous there. Mm -hmm. You know, these people really put themselves at risk, put their whole life, this man put his whole family yeah. at risk and, and you, everything. Do you know if they stayed in touch with they this They didn't family? stay in touch yeah. until my mum was in her 60s yeah. and she got a message via the Red Cross yeah. um, to reunite. Wow. Um, I think after the war, both my grandparents survived. Yeah. And so when they were reunited after the war, my grandparents wanted a new start mm -hmm. and didn't want any connection. Um, and my mum, I think, lost all contact. But... Um, when her foster father turned 90, I think it was, oh, when she was goodness. in her 60s, yeah. probably, um, she went back to Holland to, to meet them. And oh she said it was extraordinary. God. What yeah. an amazing story. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Do you, how old were you when she went back to meet? Family? How old was I? Like, probably teenager. So do you remember, yeah. like, did she involve you in the story? No. At the time? No, you didn't no, really know what was going We knew nothing about on. it at this point. We, wow. we sort of, it was sort of vague, vague stories, but nothing really. And then mum sort of said, yes, we'll go, my foster family and we were sort of right. like what because we only ever knew my grandparents you know yeah. when we were kids we'd go to holland and we'd see my grandma and my grandfather and and you know they didn't really speak english but there was it was sort of talk about it but mum i think this is something that lots of holocaust survivors have is that mm. they just don't really talk so yeah so i was going to ask you so growing up what did she used to talk about if anything really nothing really nothing we had um we grew up in a very non-Jewish area down in Dorset yeah. and there was, we were very much not different. My mum yeah. was adamant we yeah. didn't go to have any Jewish education. I think my sister once went to Haida and very quickly it was ha it didn't happen again. Yeah, we would come up. Jewish Sunday school, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. would, um, once a year we would drive up to London to see my dad's side of the family and we would have um, Passover okay. with the family, so a Jewish festival, and it was joyful and I loved it, but we yeah. knew nothing. So you knew you were Jewish? Yeah. Because both your parents were Jewish, but yeah. otherwise you had no Jewish upbringing? None whatsoever, and I've always said this, you know, I always knew what I wasn't, 
Mm-hmm. I just never really knew what I was. Yeah. I always knew that sort of when we were kids at school, you know, all the Jesus Christian um, assemblies and yeah. all of that was alien to me. I didn't understand it. And we, mm-hmm. we know we had nothing of that, obviously, at home. Yeah. But we didn't have other either. Yes. But also, mum is an eccentric foreign Jewish mother. And you can't <laughs> hide that. And so when... You know, we grew up in a very English seaside Mm. town and you can't hide a very eccentric (laughs) Jewish mother. (laughs) And so there was always, you know, we we were referred to as the Jews. So so people knew that you were Jewish. They knew that we were Jewish. So your mum wasn't trying to hide her Judaism as such. She just didn't want to relate to it. Yeah. We didn't have any Jewish friends, really. And, um, yeah, I suppose, you know, you can't hide... A surname mm-hmm. in a in an area. I've got lots of curly hair. We looked a bit different. Yeah. I can't, you know, it's actually having, you know, you talk in the, in the introduction about the job that I've just done, Jews in their own words, and working in an entirely Jewish company of actors. We all had these similar experiences where we live in a, we're not surrounded in certainly our work life by a lot mm-hmm. of other Jewish people. Yeah. And so we are very aware of little things. Mm-hmm. And so when you're in a company of Jewish actors, we all had those similar experiences, yeah. like the hair. Yeah. I mean, it became this joke in our dressing room about what products do we use on our curly hair. And as a kid, I look at, there's a nursery school photograph of, of sort of, I don't know, 25 gorgeous little children. And then yeah. there is one kid in the middle with this enormous <laughs> curly hair. And you're like, spot the Jew. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So can you remember, like, you know, going to visit your grandparents in Holland yeah. and maybe wanting to ask more questions but but not feeling it was appropriate to do so? Or, you know, was there kind of like an unwritten rule we don't talk about it? Yeah, it's a really good question. I um, No, there wasn't because we didn't really know. Mm. And also because my grandparents didn't really speak English and we didn't really speak Dutch. Yeah. Um, there was a framed certificate on my grandmother's wall from Eisenhower right which was a thank you for the um help she gave the american soldiers during the war because my grandmother ended up working for the resistance oh, wow. in amsterdam she was she was cool yeah <laughs> she was amazing <laughs> and um and so there was always this this thing on the mm-hmm. wall that we saw every time we were in the kitchen in her right. and she was a chef yeah. so uh, later on in life so we were always in her kitchen yeah. um And my mum always used to say, well, that's what Tusi did during the war. Yeah. And then we also knew that Tusi had lost a lot of family during the war, specifically, particularly her Mm -hmm. sister. So you knew about that? We knew that Tusi had a sister who died Mm -hmm. in the war. And that's all we knew. That's all you knew. That's all we knew. And you never asked more questions about it? No, I think as kids, you know, there's, um, there is a feeling that you know how far to go with the questions. Yes. Isn't there? Yeah. You, You whether it's you don't want to see your parents hurt, yeah. you, you know when to stop asking the questions. Exactly. And we, we never did. And, and the it's... certificate from Eisenhower, at what point did you kind of inquire more about that and find out how amazing your grandmother was? So when my grandmother died, mm-hmm. which was in the early 2000s, I think 2001, 2002, something like that, mm-hmm. um, there was quite a who's getting the certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Which of the children, the grandchildren, you know, um, and why is that so important? But it was really only in the last couple of years that we discovered the extent of her activities during the war. Yeah. And again, we knew, you know, as I say, my grandparents split up during the war. We knew that Tusi had gone into the resistance. Mm-hmm. We knew that there was probably love affairs going on whilst my grandfather was in hiding. Oh, wow. And, you know, in, in many ways, it sort of broke my heart thinking about that. But then yeah. in other ways, you sort of go, do you know what? They were living their lives. Mm-hmm. These Tusi was 35, yeah. something like that, during the war. Yeah. She was, she, she's, yeah. you know, she was younger than us. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she was, she was living. And so wow. you sort of go... Amazing, it's really. amazing, really, yeah. And she was in the resistance, which is, you know, so brave it's and inc- courageous. Yeah, incredible. And actually, that was another thing, because I sort of, I've always thought the people that she helped yeah. 
you know, the generations below that. Yeah. Oh, it's and amazing. It's inspiring. It is. It's it really is. It's yeah, yeah. You know, people like that, I suppose, that helped us yeah. be here today. Exactly. And helped us be proud of our exactly. Judaism. Exactly. And I feel, you know, that the people that helped my mum, mm -hmm. and, you know, it was by pure luck that my family survived and someone yeah. else's family didn't. It's yeah. pure, pure luck. Yeah. And so... You know, I think of the people that helped my mum and then I think of the people that my grandma helped and it's this yeah. incredible sort of circle of yeah, of life. Of course. And growing up in Dorset, like you said, yeah. not surrounded by many other Jewish people, do you remember as a young kid being proud to be Jewish or being a no. bit kind of ashamed of it? It's so funny. I was never proud to be Jewish. It's only been since I sort of moved to London yeah. and met my Jewish husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um it has. It was always a, a sort of part of my life. I kept very quiet. Yeah. Yeah, and I think my sister felt the same. Yeah, which I can understand when you grow up not surrounded by many other yeah. Jewish people. Yeah, and we didn't understand. We didn't understand what it meant. Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting that you use the word inherited trauma. Yes. Because it is. Um... <laughs> Some tissues have been delivered <laughs> Thank to you. you. <laughs> Sleeve is fine, but yeah. <laughs> um. No, the sort of idea of inherited trauma yeah. is never talked about, yeah. but it's hugely weighted and heavy and it's hugely in your life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it becomes a joke. You know, I cry all the time, but I cry about this all the time. Yeah. And when we did the documentary, it became a joke that, oh, God, you know, Louise <laughs> is crying again. Yeah. Um, and my sister is is almost the opposite. She's completely guarded. Yes. And I think her experience as a child was very different to mine. And I think we're obviously personality-wise okay. yeah. different. But um, still... Why was her experience different to yours, do you think? I think she's much more... She's probably more of a slightly more anxious, mm -hmm. elder sibling personality, naturally. Yeah. Yeah. And so felt the need to, whether it be to protect, to hide more. Mm -hmm. Whereas the younger sibling has that protection from the older siblings so it's a so bit she, more oblivious and yeah. a bit more like yeah whatever but yeah. still it is and it always has been and it still is you know this this weight on one's shoulders that mm. that I can't even explain in a way yeah. because I don't it's very my family survived I yeah. don't have the sort of deep trauma that well but that they didn't all survive you've already they said didn't your grandmother all survive. Sister, yeah didn't, and then they were all you know they were all split up and given them away imagine yeah. the trauma of that yeah and but, I think as well you know since having children of my own mm. you look at, at actually the sort of the 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 level the extent of of trauma tragedy yeah. and and panic and you know if that is your best option yes. to give them away if yeah. that is the yeah. most sort of positive thing you can do you think mm. my god how do, and and as well in a way because it's so often and this is something you know I'm doing more work within holocaust education and things like this but so often when you think of the holocaust you think of black and white images mm -hmm. of shtetl eastern yeah. european jews yeah. that seem so far away from you and i mm -hmm. in northwest london yeah but when you think of it of western european creative assimilated mm -hmm. people who happened to be Jewish. Yeah. And, you know, this is, for me, it's not history. It's, it's my heart, mum. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how much you know about inherited trauma. Um, I didn't know that much. Yeah. And, again, in preparation for this podcast, I actually did a bit of reading about oh, it. Oh, tell me. And I came I, I, a number of times I came across a, yeah. um, this study that they did on mice. Have you heard about this study? Tell Which, me. So they exposed the mice to the smell of cherry blossom at the same time as inflicting an electric shock on their foot. So the mice learned to associate the smell of cherry blossom with pain. The mice then had babies, and the babies had the same associated fear of the smell of cherry blossom. Wow. So this is kind of wow. the theory of inherited trauma. Yeah. And, what and, and then those babies had babies, yeah. and they had the same sensitivities to the smell of cherry blossom. But they did find that throughout the generations, it was diluted a little yeah. bit. So they were found to have, um, the offspring were found to have sensitivities yeah. rather than like kind of pure fear. But 
you know, it's fascinating. God, that's extraordinary. It's basically yeah. saying that the children of people who've been through trauma do experience the same, yeah. um, the same fears and anxieties. And it's because it's 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 not because the genes are being passed, different genes are being passed down, but the genes are being expressed differently in the offspring of people who have been through trauma. Wow. Okay. So. And then, then I kind of started reading around how do you how and again I'm not a psychologist so yeah <laughs> but this is my understanding yeah. and my take on it um, how do we how do you heal inherited trauma or you know how do you yeah. move forward if you yeah, are yeah. someone who might be suffering from inherited trauma um, and it was all about kind of what, what they did is they with the mice they were able to stop the trauma response mm -hmm. by putting the mice in a positive environment and then. They, so they put the mice in a positive environment and mm. then the mice were able to learn not to associate the smell of cherry blossom with pain. Right. So I suppose the theory is yeah. that we put humans in a positive environment and we can heal the trauma response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, That's it's, fascinating, isn't it? It it's, really is. Yeah, and it's so interesting because I've, I've met, um, you know, I, I just said I've been doing some more work around Holocaust education and I've spent mm -hmm. a lot of time with Holocaust survivors yeah. and actually a lot of second generation survivors, so my generation of, of people whose parents have mm. been through through the Second World War and there is an immediate connection. And generally speaking, because my mum was very young during the war yeah. and had my sister and I a little bit later in life, yeah. I'm quite young for that generation. So I'm spending time with maybe people in their 60s mm -hmm even 70s, yeah. um, and yet there is an unspoken, deep connection mm -hmm. that, that we have yeah. with, with experiences. And, and some people way more extreme and some people who, who you just go, I get that. Oh, my God, me yeah. too. And um, It's amazing. So yeah. at what point do you think in your life you started to realise that maybe there is some inherited trauma? Oh, gosh. I don't know, but when I look back at my childhood, you go, oh, <laughs> that makes sense. And okay. even just little things like, you know, we were brought up with a level of insular, mm -hmm. don't, it's just us. Yeah, We don't, you know, it's just the four of us. Mm -hmm. And also this sense of, quite a sense of fear. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, we never went on sleepovers. We never really stayed away. Okay. It was about staying close yeah. by. My mum kept us close. Yeah. And, I mean, there's hilarious home videos, <laughs> which, you know, 40 years ago is quite a thing, yeah. um, of, of the holidays. And you can always hear my mum in the background going, be careful, be careful, <laughs> don't do that, be careful. And, it's you know, there is a certain level of neurosis that you just accept, of but course, there, yeah. it's quite extreme. Yeah. And when you look back and when my sister and I have looked back and we've really laughed about it because you, you have to really, yeah, but you course. sort of go, wow. And do you think that's affected you as a parent? Like, how do you parent now? I'm so conscious of not being like that. My mum is amazing. My mum has been an incredible mother and I would never want to sort of go, I don't want to be like my mum because um, <laughs> I've learned all the best bits of her. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm very conscious of... Trying to let them fly yeah. a bit more. So that's interesting as yeah. well. Yeah. Because you've kind of gone the other way, potentially. Yeah. I think I would, I am probably quite laid back and sort of let's see what happens mm. kind of person. Because, maybe because of mum, maybe because of that childhood of be careful, be careful, don't yeah. do that. Oh, 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 you yeah. know, real tight anxiety and I look mm. at my mum now who she's amazing you know she's in her early 80s and she's physically brilliant she's mentally absolutely incredible yeah. and um but you can see there's a sort of deep anxiety depression that has been there you know her whole life mm. and understandably wow. so yeah and is she aware of that I don't know I really don't know would you ever talk to her about yeah. it um, would I ever talk to her about it? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, because you don't, because you are protecting her? Yeah, because I suppose we've brought, been brought up with a sort of, again, I don't want to sort of criticise my, my upbringing because it was wonderful and joyful, but it was, you know, communication wasn't at the 
foremost of, of my childhood. I think my husband would probably <laughs> agree with that. Um, but it would be, you know, so so communication is something that I, I try really hard to mm. to be open just with everything with the kids and, yeah. and to just have an absolute open conversation really healthy, isn't it? yeah so how do you feel all of that you know that uh, what we just talked about your mm. upbringing how has that kind of shaped your career as an yeah. actress so you know my mum had a career before mm. she had kids um and she had kids later on in life which is something I've always been hugely um admirable of mm -hmm. admired her for doing I think it's really impressive um and she's always given me that sense of of career, yeah. you know, of, of that's, that's really important. Yeah. And um, my sister is exactly the same. My yeah, sister she's is, a well-known cellist. My sister is Natalie Klein, a cellist, yeah, who yes. is um, a very successful, well-known soloist. Amazing. Um, and so we, you know, I think it's always been very important to me to work. Mm -hmm. It's always been important to have that identity Mm -hmm. outside of every other part of me um and and I think since having children I think being an actress and a mother mm -hmm. is really hard mm -hmm. I think that I look at a lot of my contemporaries whose careers I admire and am super impressed by and a lot of them don't have children yeah and I think um that that is a choice or circumstance has happened that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wouldn't change my choices for a single second, but it is a struggle. And every job since having children that I have accepted has come with its own huge challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, I'm not pretending that in the grand scheme of things, it is hugely important whether I say yes to a job or not yes. in the you know in yeah. life but personally you know it that sacrifices have have to be made yeah. I think you know as a woman I'm sure you feel the same well, exactly. in your job we've talked about yeah. it before it's it's very you know, hard if if you have drive to succeed in your profession unfortunately yeah. as a woman we do need to make sacrifices in our family life yeah and that can be really really challenging really challenging and I think that you know I do I do also feel very strongly that the kids need to see their mothers working mm -hmm. um my kids need to see me working because it makes me happy yeah. I think that my kids I want my daughters to see that it's it's good to go out and work yes. independently. And have your own, exactly. Have your own independence and your mm. own sense of self-worth. And I think it's important for my son to see that too, that mm. women go out and work. Absolutely. Um, however, and also they have the most extraordinary daddy mm. who picks up the pieces when I'm yeah, not there. Which and is important. Which is so important. And they have mm. a relationship with their dad that is entirely equal to yeah. to their mum so you know I feel very supported yeah. in the choices I make but you know I'm not I'm not pretending that that there was times when I was filming Emmerdale mm -hmm. and I would I would come home I would commute to Leeds yeah. because I wanted from to London. from London I would just want to give them a kiss even if they were asleep and I would get the 5.50 train in the morning yeah. and I would be up in Leeds by 8.30 yeah and I would film and then I would come home and they would be asleep and I would mm. give them a kiss and I would do the same thing the next oh, day. But exhausting. it was it was crazy. It was crazy. And I remember there was a time when we were doing about two or three weeks of night shoots up wow. in Leeds. And well, every I night was, in a row. So every night in a row. Wow. Yeah. It was probably maybe maybe not three weeks, but it was over one, two weeks, let's say two weeks. Yeah. Um, and it, it I remember there was a few days where I would pick the kids up from school at four o'clock. Yeah. I would jump on a train up to Leeds. Um, I would film till maybe three or four in the morning. Mm -hmm. I would sleep on the floor of my dressing room. Oh. 
<laughs> until the train, the first train of the day from Leeds. I would get back down to London. I would take mm. the kids to school. I would <laughs> sleep in the day. I would pick the kids up from school and I would do that wow. again. And it was, I mean, it was mental. It was yeah. ridiculous and how, stupid. How long did you do that for? Probably about three or four days until I was literally <laughs> rocking in the corner crying. But em Emmerdale, <laughs> were you Emmerdale for a couple of years? Yeah. Right? So that's a long time though to commute. It was a long time. I mean, listen, I did stay up in Leeds in hotels occasionally mm -hmm. and I would, if I was in first thing in the morning, I couldn't commute yeah. it. Um, so I did, I did sleep in hotels uh, as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and my littlest son, he was only, he was probably, he was one when I started. So mm. he was, you know, Very so little. he was little. I was still breastfeeding him. Yeah. So, you know. so where do you get your, you know, your motivation, your drive from to do that? Because that's, that's a hard choice. Um, I think as an actor, when the jobs come and when a good job comes, there, there comes a moment when you go, is this a hobby or mm -hmm. is this my career? Yeah. And if this is my career, then I have to do it. Yeah. And, you know, recently working on this theatre job, we had a holiday booked that mm -hmm. had been booked for over a year that was an incredibly special holiday with my parent-in-laws, yes. um, a very, very special trip that had been arranged. And this job came up. Mm -hmm. And it was a very difficult decision. Yeah. But in one way, there was absolutely no decision to be made because it's my work and it was something that I never imagined. You know, as you read out my tweet, it is yeah. a theatre that I've always wanted to work at. Mm -hmm. And as I've got older, my Jewish identity has become much more part of who I am. Mm. So to be able to be in a play that explores Jewish identities in the 21st century yeah. and anti-Semitism in the most amazing theatre, mm. of course I'm not going to say no to that for a holiday. Mm. And I was very confident in knowing that my kids would be okay. Yeah, I think, you know, again, this is something we've talked about, but I think that if you know that they're okay... Yeah. I, yeah. I can deal with my own distress. <laughs> if they're unhappy, yeah. then then yeah. we have to think again. Yeah. So if your kids are happy, you're happy, basically. Yeah. So, so you kind of said, you know, if it's my career, I have to do it. But do you enjoy doing it? I love it. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's a well, problem. But, but that's but the thing, that's isn't it? That's the thing. And I think, mm. you know, doing Emmerdale, it was brilliant. Yeah. I loved it. It was such an extraordinary challenge. And it was something that I never had maybe wished to do when I left drama school you know you leave drama school and you think I want to be at the National Theatre I want yeah. to be at the Royal Shakespeare Company I want to go to Hollywood whatever it yeah. is and it's maybe a soap isn't the thing that you first think mm -hmm. that's what I want to do but yeah. it was brilliant yeah. and it was absolutely a way of honing one's skills in a very specific way and so um you know, I loved it. Loved and then it, doing yeah. this play recently, it's, I, I didn't get to put my kids to bed mm. a single night and yeah. I ached for that. Yeah. But I stood on that stage every night with however many hundreds of people watching, telling this story. Mm. And, and it was an amazing it, story. It was an amazing story and it was mm. an important story. Yes. And it was sort of, I think, more than just a, yeah. a, a theatre run. It yeah. was something... Um, yeah, as a you know well-known actress who's quite vocal about her Judaism, have you ever experienced anti-Semitism? Um, it's really interesting because nothing that I have felt threatened by, mm -hmm. but throughout the process of rehearsal for this play, there was many many times where I would sit back and go, "Well, yeah, I had that." Well, yeah, I had that. Mm. You know, when I first left drama school, I was in the casting for quite a big movie yeah. and it got quite serious and I was, you know, recall after recall and meetings with directors and producers and mm -hmm. it all looked at one point like this was really exciting. And um, I remember being told, you should probably change your name because it sounds too ethnic. Oh, wow. <coughs> Excuse me. And I sort of was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, okay, if that means I get the job, fine. <laughs> and then you look back Gosh. on it and you go, wow. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was one ex experience of anti-Semitism. I've had yeah. conversations with people. I remember once an actor turning around to me, slightly inebri inebriated, <laughs> no doubt, but turned around to me and said, you know, the problem with you Jews. Oh, dear. And and you sort of go, no, 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 let's just stop that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, it's all, I've got so much I want to talk to you about, but I, you know, I like to kind of try and tie Come things back. up. Yeah, yeah. Like you can, you know, hopefully we'll have another chat at a it, later day. And I've got loads more that I yeah. can ask you about, but I like to kind of end mm. these conversations. 
If you could have told yourself something as you were going through that period, what, what would you tell yourself now? Oh, I wish that I could have asked my grandma more questions. Yeah. Ask more questions. Yeah. I wish that I, you know, I think that it's so important to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now with my young kids, I think this is why I keep pushing my mum now and why I've become much more vocal about my Jewish identity and my mum talking more about it now in, mm. in her 80s because it's for the next generation. It's, exactly. it's to keep these stories alive. And I think, yeah, if, I, if, if that's one thing I wish, and my yeah. grandfather, who was this magical man, that, really? as I say, just didn't really speak Amazing. English, but he was incredible. Amazing. Well, I mean, thank you for sharing your story with us today. Not because, at all. you know, by sharing your story as well, hopefully we're going to kind of inspire and educate other people. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lisa. Oh, Emma, it's gorgeous thank to you. talk to you. Thanks. <laughs> We're so excited that the first series of When Life Gives You Lemons is sponsored by Coe's Linen. Coe's supply some of the UK's finest hotels with luxury linens, including bedding, towels and bathrobes. So if you want to feel like you're on holiday or a spa break every day, then I can highly recommend their products. I really love my personalised bathrobe. You know that feeling when you've had a long day at work or a really hard workout. That's when all I want is to have a hot bath dry myself in my fluffy Coe's towel and then relax on the sofa. And that is when you'll find me in my Coe's bathrobe. Honestly, the most cosy item I've ever owned. All products can be personalised with custom monograms designed by leading interior designer Sophie Patterson. You can find them exclusively online at www.coeslinen.com. Listeners to When Life Gives You Lemons can save 10% with the discount code POD10. You can find a link in the show notes. Doo, 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 doo.